All right, everybody. Hey, wait, wait, hang on. I had to fix my hair. Did hey, you fix your hair? I did. I did. So you ready? I'm ready for real now. <laughs> hey, everybody. Richard Wilson here with CRNA School Prep Academy. Glad to have Nicole Cupcheck here. Thanks hey. for joining us. Thanks for having me. We're both here at NTI 2025, and many of you know Nicole from her CCRN prep material, so we're excited to have her. And we've got a great topic for you today. Today, we're going to talk about cardiogenic shock. So I know this is one that a lot of you are interested in in the ICUs probably take care of a lot of patients that have that. So tell us a little bit about the pathophysiology behind it. Yeah, I think one of the things you've always got to think about when you're caring for a patient with cardiogenic shock is number one, early recognition. And that's been a major issue. Um, a lot of times patients are found when they've already got elevated lactate levels or already starting to kind of have secondary organ injury. And it's truly, it's, it's important to kind of back things up and identify much earlier than that. So there's things that we can look for. Like for example, you know, are they, do they have an S3 heart sound as a sign of fluid overload? You know, are they starting to develop crackles? Do they have knee modeling? There's actually a validated tool where you start at the knees and look above and below the knees to see how far they're modeled. And if you've got modeling up into the mid thigh fold of the groin or above the groin, you've got a patient who's in a lot of trouble. Are they urinating? Are they mentating? And so looking for those subtle signs and symptoms are going to be really important. Uh, number two, I would say is you have to understand the, the etiology of the cardiogenic shock. That is so important. And it, like for example, your heart failure patients who exacerbate or are hypotensive, that's actually cardiogenic shock. Um, if you have a patient with an anterior septal lateral wall MI, for example, that is a patient who is at massive risk for cardiogenic shock. So it's all, again, it's always identifying like what that etiology is. Is it a septic patient who now is deteriorated and is in cardiogenic shock? You know, so going back to like the why are we in this situation? And then treatment from that point may vary a little bit. Yeah, and so when we talk about really looking at the cardiogenic shock, one thing to remember is just really pretty simple, is just going into heart failure, as you mentioned there. And we've got to think about when these patients come in, you know, all the stress they've been underneath, whether it's a trauma patient, whether it's a medical patient, all the stress the heart's been yeah. during all of this situation. Um, now, we were just talking shortly before coming on here, and you were sharing with us that there's some new guidelines in some of the yeah. management and treatment of this. Uh, share those with us. Yeah. So there's a group called the Sky. It's called Sky. And they, uh, it was about three years ago, put out basically stages of cardiogenic shock. And the tie the stages with what you're seeing physiologically. And then, of course, the hemodynamics in the shock state. And, um, and again, they focus so much on early recognition. But, you know, when you look at the mortality of cardiogenic shock, you'll see stats for mortality anywhere from like 30 to 50% or 40 to 60%. Regardless, it's high. I mean, can you imagine if you had a 50-50 chance of making it out of the hospital because you're in a shock state? Those are not stats I'd want to face. Exactly. And so truly, um, you know, recognition is going to be a cornerstone. Uh, but, when, you know, they've done evaluations looking at different mechanical circulatory support devices. And really, it seems like the impella is the winner. Uh, you know, there's two different sizes of impella for the left ventricle to help offload that left ventricle. And the size that gets inserted depends on, you know, basically what is the patient's hemodynamic mm -hmm. status. Balloon pumps for cardiogenic shock have not really been shown to be overly favorable. They augment the cardiac output about a half a liter to one liter a minute. Where we're using more balloon pumps now is for exacerbated heart failure for afterload reduction. Or like if we've got a, a patient with a left, like with left main disease, who's going to go for cabbage, we might put a balloon pump in that patient to help with coronary perfusion. And then VA ECMO, really where the data stands right now is we're using it for uh, patients who are absolutely crashing with cardiogenic shock. But really Impella seems to be kind of the sweet spot for technology and mechanical circulatory support. And a lot of that is driven by calculating what's called the CPO or cardiac power output which is a sign that your left ventricle is failing uh, if it's low. Um, and it's like normal, air quote normal, would be greater than like 0.6 watts. So, you know, if you've got a patient who's below 0.6 watts, they're, they're likely on the road to needing some sort of a left 
ventricular assist device. And then PAPI is pulmonary arterial pulsatility index. And that gives us an indication if the right ventricle is failing in which, you know, we do have right sided impellas. We've got right sided ventricular assist devices and things that we can use to treat the right side of the heart. So really when you're looking at the circulatory support, it really is about balloon pump just kind of being a little bit of a, an augmentation, maybe to kind of a crutch to get you to a specific spot. Um, the impeller device is really, it's more support and then yeah. ECMO really in your kind of emergency yeah. last ditch kind of efforts. Um, but really when we talk about that too is obviously these patients are critical patients. So they're not yeah. just on mechanical support. They're going to also be on some kind of vasoactive agents yeah. that um, help support that, right? These form of uh, pharmacology is important in that and understanding it. So um, when you look at the support that these ICU nurses will be using for cardiogenic shock patients, yeah. what are some of those meds? Yeah, I would say for blood pressure support, for the most part, again, it's been studied, norepinephrine seems to be the winner. Um, norepinephrine gives a lot of alpha receptor stimulation, so you get that peripheral vasoconstriction, and you get a little bit of beta-1. Um, so that's one of the benefits. Now, because of that beta one, you may see tachycardias, but I'll be honest, sometimes you can see the reverse as well. You can see reflexive bradycardias. Um, you know, you have to remember anytime you're using a vasopressor, it causes your vessels to vasoconstrict, which is going to increase their afterload and increase the workload of the heart. So it's always a trade-off. The trade-off being I need an augmented pressure, which we're hoping equates to flow, because really it's all about blood flow, right? But we're hoping that higher pressure equates to higher blood flow to perfuse your vital organs. So it's a big trade-off when you use a vasopressor. So speaking of that, and I know you're probably going to talk about some inotropic agents here in just a few, but you know, on those vasopressor side of that, that's important to remember, because as we talk about that and we look at it, MAP does not always equal flow. Oh, MAP yeah. just is pressure, but does not. And I think that's something that we have to really consider, yeah. which is the reason why when I was in the ICU 20 years ago or 25 years ago, we used a lot of alpha-1 agents like phenylephrine and so forth, yeah. right? And we didn't have as much levofed that we utilized. But it's important now thinking about that beta-1 kit. Yeah to think about perfusion versus just getting an artificial number of an increased MAP, assuming that that's leading to flow. Yeah. So as we look at some of those other cardiogenic agents or cardi cardiogenic shock treatment agents, you know, what are some of the others that you use? Yeah, um, so as far as pressors, I'll be honest, like the use of vasopressin, you have to remember how it works. It's an antidiuretic hormone. So it works on vasopressin 1 receptors to cause peripheral vasoconstriction, but it also says to the kidneys, hold on to sodium and water. And if you've got somebody who's already overloaded because their left ventricle is failing, it may not be the best option in a lot of cases. We may use low-dose epinephrine, and epinephrine, the effects you get from it all depend on the dose you're using. So at lower doses, you get more of that positive inotropy. A lot of cardiac surgeons like to use low-dose epinephrine, but the trade-off there is the tachycardia that you see with it. I would say in general, phenylephrine is one of those things I don't see very often in shock. Um, anesthesia loves it. In fact, you're a serenace. I got to tease you, you know, that you carry mystery unlabeled syringes of yeah, it in your pockets and post-op, pow, pow. And you're like, oh, their pressure's better. You know, so, but in shock, it's one of those drugs that's kind of challenging because it is a pure alpha and you get just that peripheral constriction without much beta one. So I just don't see it used a lot. And then as far as inotropes, dobutamine and milrinone, I would say with low dose epinephrine would be our, our three main options. And milrinone is, I love milrinone, but you know, one of the surgeons I work with always says, I love milrinone, but you got to invite her best friend, norepinephrine, because it causes so much vasodilation, which is good because that decreases afterload. But the trade-off is that patients may get hypotensive and the half-life is about two and a half hours. So it's got a long half-life. Whereas dobutamine is quick on, quick off. It's a catecholamine, right. two minute onset, two minute half-life. Um, but again, because it's a beta one, you see tachycardias with it. So I think at the bedside as a CRNA, as a critical care nurse, it's just important to understand how all the drugs work to best choose what you're going to use in a different clinical situation. And so I will tell you, early in my career as a nurse anesthetist, I did use a lot of phenylephrine because that's what we kind of got yeah. trained on. And it was in looking at a lot of recent studies 
Um, and over the years now, I've started transitioning into using a lot more levofed and norepinephrine yeah. um, because of that beta kick that we get. And, and like I said, now getting to be able to have flow and perfusion um, on that. Now, one last thing that I want to touch base with you as we yeah. talk about cardiogenic shock is obviously we've got the mechanical support that you were talking about. Um, most of these patients are already going to be on some kind of ventilatory support. We've talked about the uh, pharmacology and, and the pharmacological therapy, but you cannot get away from fluid volume management also because it's a heart. We got yeah, to look sure. at preload. We've got yeah. to look at cardiac output. 100%. So tell us a little bit um, about what the studies are showing or the guidelines on uh, fluid volume management these patients. Yeah, well, you you know, you would think these patients would need a ton of diuretics when they're failing. But interestingly enough, you know, we see actually decent effects from lower dose Lasix. Um, we, what you don't want to do is give a whopping massive dose of Lasix, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, they're, the shock is now worse, right? So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll titrate using like 20 milligrams of Lasix at a time and kind of see how the patient responds and then escalate as needed. Um, as far as volume, you, you have to remember when the right heart fails, it likes volume. When the left heart fails, it likes a diuretic. And so it's quite a dichotomy, you know, when you think about the two ventricles. And so I, I can't say enough about the importance of using ultrasound and echo to actually look at the heart look to see how the walls are moving um, to really identify, you know, what would be the best therapy. Because the last thing you want to do is volume overload, you know, a patient whose left ventricle is failing. And the last thing you want to do is diuresis a patient who's got right ventricular failure in the acute setting of hypotension. So, you know, it's, it's important. I think this is where ultrasound is just, it's got to be done in these patients and you've got to look at how, what the heart is looking like. Which really, and as we look at it, we look at point of care ultrasound and doing TTEs, yeah. TEEs. We've got all of those technologies you can use. We've got these stroke volume variance monitors yes. that can also be utilized. Which so I love, yeah. There's a lot of things. So, Nicole, thank you for joining yeah, us. Of course, it was a pleasure seen. seeing you yeah, again. It was great. Yeah. Um, we're here again at NTI 2025. We're excited and have a great day.